have museum director Jim Peterson, so everyone give him a wave. But welcome back for our sixth installment of our live history lesson series. It's good to have you with us. Today we're going to be discussing a topic which has probably been in a lot of our minds recently, and that's of rationing. Though, of course, we're going to talk specifically about World War II. But to start off with, what is rationing? So a, something you might have noticed recently as we're in a global pandemic is a month or so ago as things really started to look pretty gloomy, we realized people were going to the stores and hoarding important supplies like toilet paper, um, milk, canned goods, meat, sanitary supplies, all of which are important for everyone, yet there were just a select number of people who were running to the store and buying up all that they could. Now, if you went back to a store not too long after that initially happened, you probably noticed that throughout these stores there were signs that were saying limit one or two of this particular item per person so that the store could try to stretch their supply and that people had a better chance of getting these necessary items that they needed. So that's the basic idea of rationing, is to limit your intake and to kind of help spread that out as well over time or th through people, as was really happening in World War II. Um, so this rationing actually happened before World War II. The United States realized that war was kind of imminent, so they were already building up their um, military power, getting new airplanes, ships, vehicles, etc. So by August of 1941, so we went to war in December of 1941, President Roosevelt had already said um, in August, I'm going to create the Office of Price Administration. So the purpose of the Office of Price Administration, or the OPA, was they were going to put ceilings on the prices of goods so that there was no price gouging as there was a fluctuation in supply and demand, which is something we've seen happen lately as people who have these supplies are trying to sell them at higher prices. But they were also responsible for the rationing efforts and figuring out how that was going to play out throughout the duration of the war. So that primarily our military men were going to have the supplies they needed um, in the United States and overseas, and that what was left for the civilian populace would be spread out evenly. So the first thing that the um, OPA came up with was ration books. So we're going to take a look at one of these right here. So beginning in 1942, the first ration books were issued. So these would be issued to individuals. They would have their information on the front. And then you would open it up, and you would have these different kind of stamps. Now our different books are going to have different kind of stamps. And these are all, these two are book fours. There's book threes, book twos, and ones. And they all had kind of different purposes. And they all were changing throughout the war. But you can see there's different kind of stamps here. So what happens is, particularly for these kind, is that denotes the number of points that each stamp is worth. So these guys started using a point rationing system. So since Chuck Jones, the creator of Looney Tunes, can explain it better through his wartime video, I'm going to pull that up for you for a better explanation of how these ration books were working. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, gotcha. Sorry about that. So here's this video explaining. This lady, all decked out with her family's brand new ration books, starts out to do some shopping. First of all, she wants to buy a can of peas. So what it's showing right here is the price list that each store she would wants have. To buy a can of chicken soup. And that would change throughout the war, so they would have to have an updated list and people would have to see how the points had changed for various items. And she wants some dried prunes. Well, there's a 
our list complete, and all that remains to be done is to tear out 14 points in stamps and pay the grocer. But wait just a minute. Just for fun, let's take another look at that point ration table. Hey, slow down there. What about those string beans? Why, there are only three points in the size we want. If we buy those instead of peas, we can save five points. And what's this? Fresh apples don't require any points. Well, why not buy those instead of dried prunes? And save another point. So there we are, our shopping list complete. With the same amount of goods, and with six points saved for future use. Smart girl. She's smart in more ways than one, too. Because she used her large stamps first, wisely saving her small ones for low-point purchases later on. Because she shops early in the day, and so helps her grocer. Because wherever possible, she substitutes unrationed fresh fruits and vegetables for canned or processed ones. This is point rationing. This is the way to assure everyone here at home an equal opportunity to get the same fair share. This is the way to assure food for our fighting men and for our fighting allies. Share and share alike is the American way to victory. So I hope you heard that. It said share and share alike. That was the tagline of the video. So it was telling them how they need to share and that this is going to help spread out these rations for them. So let me just bring up our bigger picture for you again. So this is one of the common posters you would have seen in World War II. So up top is a representation of without these ration books, what would happen? This woman in front came along and took all of the supplies, no more on the meat hooks, and this woman's pretty upset on the right-hand side there. Um, and then here on the bottom, we have, they both use their ration stamps, and now they each have their own fair supply, and there's still meat on the hooks for the next customers who come along. So Jerry's asking a question, who paid the actual cost of the stamps? Well, the stamps really weren't worth any monetary value. The stamps were just to help... Sp so they would actually go up to the cashier with the money for the products, and then the stamps would be used to verify that they could um, get this item, that they hadn't already used their allotment for the month. They would get these books every month. So when they were out of stamps, um, that was it for the month. They couldn't buy any more of these limited supplies. So as Becky is also asking, no, they weren't just using the stamps, but they had to have the accompanying money as well. The stamps are what's helping spread it around. So there's an example of some other stamps that would have been in the books. And here's a price chart you might have seen in one of the stores. So up in the corner we have peas, 16 points. You have canned pears, 21 points. You have all sorts of juices that go up to 32 points. So you can see how you could eat through your monthly allotment of stamps pretty quickly. So that made it all the more important um, as people realized occasionally they were buying um, items and they had more stamps than they needed to pay with. So say you have a 8 point stamp but you only need 6 of those points and that's all you have left. Well, what would happen is you would give them that eight point stamp and you're out two stamps or two points. So by 1943, they came along with this other method here. So here we have a ration book and token holder and the tokens look like this. So it's kind of hard to see through our camera here, but this is an OPA red point. So, assume that same situation happens where you need to spend six points, but you only have an eight-point stamp. The grocer was allowed to give you two of these stamps, or two of these tokens. And the good thing about these is these didn't expire, unlike the stamps, which would expire every month if they weren't used. So, now you could actually have change for the stamps you were using and stretch those further along. So, this later book shows where you had a place to keep your tokens that you were getting and then you could stash your various ration books. 
let's see where we're at. So in addition to having to use the stamps for purchasing items, um, the United States was just trying to um, stretch all of our supplies as much as possible. So what started in World War I was victory gardens so that people would raise their own produce and help um, keep more for the national level and for our soldiers overseas. So this continued in World War II. Eleanor Roosevelt even um, started a victory garden on the White House lawn. And here you can see all of our favorite heroes, Superman, Batman, and Robin, out there plowing the fields and picking their plants. So Victory Gardens actually produced about one-third of all the produce in the United States during the war, so they really were successful. Um, then something else that happened is people had to get pretty creative um, with some of their menu items. So meat, of course, was extremely rationed because that was something that the men fighting the war particularly needed. So people were getting a lot less than they were expecting. An example would be Boston. They would consume about a million pounds in, let's see, in a day. A million pounds of meat in a day. And that equated to about 75 carloads of meat that they would be getting from these plants to send out to their butchers and the populace. Well, as the war started, that went down to like three carloads of meat a day. So you can see how much less these people were getting. So something that happened is people started eating horse meat because horse meat wasn't rationed so they didn't have to have stamps for it. Um, another example is rabbits. These are actual posters from World War II and people were encouraged to raise their own rabbits because they could eat any number of things, hedge, weeds, garden waste, and kitchen scraps so they're not taking up any vital resources. And then as this one says, one rabbit has at least 12 young in a year and that's 45 pounds of meat and it's all off the ration, so you can eat as much of that as you want. Um, Gourmet Magazine in 1943 published a recipe, and it was headed with, although it isn't our usual habit, this year we're eating the Easter rabbit. So that's a little depressing, but you can see the lengths that these people were going to to provide their families with the meals they needed. And to kind of ration this out even more, people would limit um, what days they would eat certain products. So I've heard a lot of people say, yeah, we had fish Fridays, etc. So that was the only day of the week where you could use whatever fish you happen to have and eat it just to try to stretch what you had. Um, so along with meats was our fat, um, fat collection drive. So when you were done with one of these meat products and you had a lot of grease in the pan, say you just cooked bacon, what you would do is you were supposed to take an open-mouthed can, often people were using coffee cans or things, you would put a strainer over top of this, and then you would pour that grease in. And so once you had a pound worth of that grease, that bake or, that bake or meat fat, um, then you would take that to the local butcher, if that was a collection station, and he would actually pay you for that. So there was an incentive to save your precious cooking waste because of course that's where a lot of the flavor comes from especially when your rations have decreased so that's why the government was willing to pay for this stuff but as you can see in our posters the reason why these um, waste fats were so important is because they're actually used to make glycerin which is then used to make gunpowder so you can see these posters kind of get the point across and this one over here actually shows her delivering it to the butcher But a couple of factoids that they would put on these posters or have for their drives um, would be something like, one tablespoonful of kitchen grease fires five bullets, or one pound of kitchen fats makes enough dynamite to blow up a bridge. So they would use those kind of factors so people could actually feel that they were making an impact with this pound of bacon grease that they were taking to the butcher. Um, something else that came along, or that can really contributed a lot of its success to World War II is our favorite Kraft mac and cheese. I don't know where I would be if I didn't have this for my two-year-old daughter because it's all she'll eat. And that's largely in part to World War II. Um, Kraft mac and cheese came out in 1937, so they're still in the Great Depression. And then, and it was really cheap. It was like 19 cents a box or less. 
And then as the rationing came along, it took maybe one or two stamps to buy a box of Kraft macaroni and cheese, which could then feed a family of four pretty easily and get them a lot of the nutrients that they actually needed. So just because the people had to have it and it tasted good, that's where Kraft mac and cheese really blew up. So I mean, a lot went into this. So in addition to food products, there was a lot to do with the automotive industry. So just a couple hours before we started this presentation, we had Stephen Marquardt, who is the son of George and Bernice Marquardt, and his father George was part of the Atomic Mission Group. He was a B-29 pilot. But he sent us these images. These are from their war ration wallet. So in addition to the ration books, this would have had some of your other supplementary items, particularly for like automobiles. So inside, you would have certain stickers you needed. You would actually put these on your car and that would um, denote when you pulled up to a service station how much gas you were allowed. And so you can see in this wallet there would be different reasons like official government of Red Cross business, transportation of four or more to school. So depending on what services you were rendering with your vehicle depended, um, factored into how much fuel you were going to be rationed. So that's kind of an example of how they did that. And here you can see different ads. Don't waste paper. Don't forget sugar stamp number 13, good for five pounds of sugar for those dates. So these things were always changing. But this was all the more important because starting in 1942, all of these automotive manufacturers ceased building civilian automobiles and started working for the war effort and producing wartime vehicles, etc. So if you had a car, that's a good start, but if anything went wrong with that car, it was going to be difficult to get spare parts. Um, so you really wanted to try to make these things last. So of course they wanted to conserve gasoline because we have vehicles, planes, ships, etc. all around the world that are consuming hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel. So here's a couple posters to promote carpooling. Help win the war, squeeze in one more. And our favorite, when you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. Join a car sharing club today. So you can see Hitler right there in the passenger seat. So just imagine you're walking down the street, or more importantly, you're driving down the street in your car by yourself and you see that poster. How are you going to feel about your contributions to the war effort? So guilt kind of played a role in, these, in this propaganda campaign for rationing. So here's another good example. In, in addition to conserving gasoline, we were trying to conserve rubber. Because early on, we, um, as the Japanese were expanding through the Pacific, they captured 95% of the world's rubber. So we were hurting for a while until we developed our own synthetic rubbers. So the civilian populace had to rely on other factors. They had to retread their tires, which even that was difficult to do as supplies dwindled. Um, in this case, this Cadillac owner put hardwood tires on his vehicle. Now he said if you had four of those tires on, it was incredibly difficult to control because there was zero traction. But once he put on his rubber drive wheels and then had a couple of his hard wheel tires there, he was able to kind of handle it better. So they were very innovative with what they were doing. Here's another good example of saving rubber. This is actually from Great Britain but you can see a comparison of three cyclists and it shows their tires. So cyclist number one is a patriot. He keeps his tires pumped up um, to a hard, secure maximum, hard to secure maximum mileage and immunity from punctures. And then you get to cyclist three, who says without realizing it is an ally of Hitler for his grossly underinflated tires can yield only a fraction of the mileage built into them. So you're gonna feel pretty guilty if you're riding around with a poorly inflated bike tire. So even that much rubber made a difference to the war effort. And here's another good example that Stephen Marquardt sent us. This was in that wartime um, wallet. So this shows you how much this rubber was rationed. This is a special um, stamp or certificate used to obtain footwear. Because clothing and especially footwear were hard to come by mainly because they, the footwear used rubber and also typically leather. So you'd have to have special certificates and you were pretty lucky if you got new um, shoes. But you can see all this different, all these different uh, facts in these books. We need 842,000 tons um, of rubber. 
We have 431,000 tons of rubber we can count on from these supplies, and so people's rationing is what's helping fill the shortages for the military. So they're seeing this rationing propaganda all over. Another good example, we'll look at this um, Saturday evening post that we pulled out of our collection. So in here, this is an ad from Texaco saying you should use our gas because it's more reliable and you want to make sure your car's not going to burn up, which would mean your ration book is being burned up. Here's a good one from Kellogg's. So another way that they would stretch their meat rations is they would often mix in bread or cereal. So they're selling their delicious cereal and they even recommend that. Stretch meat, cereals can help. So you're seeing all the ways that their cereal is going to help you ration and feed your family. We have a lovely Dr. Pepper supported Onward Golden Garden Soldiers um, advertisement. So after you're done working in your victory garden, you deserve a nice cold drink of Dr. Pepper. And then back to the topic of rubber we were just discussing. You can see still a rubber crisis in 1943 and this goes step by step through different things you can do to make your tires last even longer. And this is even after we developed synthetic rubber and didn't need it as much, but anything we could save was important for the war effort. So different factors that occurred because of our rationing of the automotive industry was there was a lot more use of public transportation and where all that, especially trains, had military priority. I mean, those were crowded. It was not a fun time for people. So, in addition to food and your automobiles, we were also trying to conserve clothing. So this is one of the most common phrases you'll hear. Use it up, wear it out, and make it do. So this housewife here is patching her husband's trousers, and he is fixing up their lawnmower because they can't afford to get a new one with how precious metal is for the war. So everyone got in on this. Um, it was, of course, difficult to obtain clothes because of the rationing. And realizing this, a lot of flower companies and different companies that sold their products in like canvas or burlap bags, they realized that moms were going home and making these into dresses for like their daughters, using it as clothing. So they actually started putting floral patterns on their canvas bags so that the girls could have something pretty to wear once that was turned into a dress. So everyone was working together. This was really a united home front and rationing really pulled everyone together. So another great example of something that became highly rationed before the war was nylon and silk. So women were very excited to have nylon hosiery, but those pretty quickly went away for the sake of making parachutes and other vital war products. So in this picture, you can see she's drawing a line up her leg. So what women would do is they would actually take like um, gravy browning powder or um, shoe polish and mix it with some cream and they would rub it on their legs so it looked like they were wearing a stocking. And then to make it more convincing, they would draw a line up the back of their legs as a seam just to make it all the more convincing and so they felt like they were properly dressed even when they were sacrificing their precious nylon hosiery for the war effort. So everyone was taking part. I mean, all the way up to celebrities were running scrap drives. Here's Rita Hayworth. Um, you say, please drive carefully. My bumpers are on the scrap heap. She donated her bumpers off her fancy car to be scrapped and made into a wartime vehicle. So, I mean, celebrities, big time people were really helping push these different drives to ration all these items. But on a more local level, here we have an example of the Utah Minute Women. So the Utah Minute Women, first of all, let me tell you, I found most of this information from a great article by Aubrey Glazier on the Intermountain Stories website. So I'll post a link to that when we're done here so you can take a look at it. But the Utah Minute Women were part of the um, Volunteer Salvage Corps. So the Volunteer Salvage Corps was a nationwide um, division of the OPA. And the, or the, the War Production Board, and their goal was to disperse volunteers throughout the country to run these scrap drives and to be collecting these materials. 
So the Utah Minute Women had 32 county directors, 333 city chairwomen, and 8,000 Utah Minute Women. So there's 8,000 women throughout Utah who are running these volunteer scrap drives to help collect these items. So you can see in this picture here from the Utah State Historical Society, they're running a scrap drive and we have iron and steel bed frames and all sorts of other pieces that people have brought in to make their contributions and help fight the war. And one of the reasons they were so well suited to do this is a lot of them were already involved in church groups, in social groups, and they also requisitioned the help of the boy and girl scouts. They would go door to door and collect donations or um, pick up scrap paper, etc. So that's what they were really involved in during the wartime. They exerted a lot of effort. This is their booth at the Utah State Fair during the war. So it's covered in these um, propaganda posters for rationing. And here in the bottom right corner, you can see this example where they're probably talking about those excess waste fats and saying the different size of shells that so much um, fat is going to help fill with gunpowder. So I just wanted to share this. The way I actually found out about the Utah Minute Women, um, this past year we had a visitor named Lizette Robb who came in and had a question about this certificate that she found as she was going through her grandmother's genealogy. So it says, State of Utah Minute Women, Certificate of Merit in Utah Minute Women. In recognition for patriotic effort during World War II in the state and national salvage activities and other war programs, this um, citation is awarded to Miss Eva Featherstone, who then became Miss Eva May Baxter. So we were curious what this is. I'd never seen something like this before, but we tied it back to the Utah Minute Women and their um, salvage drives to collect this scrap for the war effort. So there's a picture of Eva there. So we appreciate Lizette Robb and her contribution to our historical research here. Um, so just to end on rationing, you have to realize the sacrifice that these people were making. They had really just come out of the Great Depression. They finally had money in their pockets and were living a comfortable lifestyle. They were living that lavish American lifestyle where they had more than they needed and more than they wanted. And then here the government comes along not long after and says, we're going to need you to cut way down on the resources you're using so that we can fight this war and win it. And the people really pulled together and did it. We have this young boy here using a war ration book for his first time. Everyone was a part of this. The youngest kids were out there collecting scrap and the adults were out there working gardens, working on their automobiles so that they could conserve all the fuel, rubber, metal that they needed for the war. So, I mean, we have to be appreciative of what your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, whatever the case may be, were doing during this time. And, I mean, if any of them are still alive, I certainly encourage you to ask them what their experiences were during this time, because they're going to remember something from it, whether it be an awful recipe, eating rabbits, not being able to drive anywhere. They're going to have a story to tell. Um, so... That's wartime rationing, so if you have any questions or comments, let us know. We'll also get to them later after the video in the comments. And one last plug for our museum website, wendoverairbase.com. If you visit that website, you can find our PX online store link for the gift shop. And there you can find um, wonderful hats, shirts, bags, all sorts of gifts. 